better than the one we were left with. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the Sunday South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation and every corner of our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to see it. Come, Come let us worship together. Now, if you'll join me in saying the congregational affirmation, which is in your order of service and sometimes shows up on the screen. <laughs> Love is the spirit of this church and service its call. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Our time for all ages today is one of my favorites. We've done this before, but I think it's an apropos of this moment. It's called Louis the First, King of the Sheep. By the way, and I'm gonna need a tiny bit of help for this. We're gonna need some wind. So every time the wind comes, can we make the wind like a wave? <laughs> Can we try it again? That was kind of sad. Ready? Go. <laughs> Thank you. Louis the First, King of the Sheep. And here we see a sheep on a very windy day. And we see a blue crown floating in the wind for it. And the blue crown gets closer and it lands at his feet and he puts it on his head and suddenly he stands upright and becomes a regal sheep. And so it was on one windy day that Louis the sheep thereby became Louis the first king <laughs> of the sheep. The first thing Louis the first thought that was to govern, a king should have a scepter. And so we see Louis the first walking around with a twig and the scepter looking down on all the other sheep. And the throne from which to hand down justice, because justice is rather important. And here we see him up in a tree looking even further down at all. <laughs> and a grand king's bed, where all could behold him as he settled down for the night. And there we see a royal bed with all the other sheep quite far away. <laughs> Louis the First also told himself that a good king should address his people from time to time. And here he is up on his tippy toes and blue high heels speaking into <laughs> microphone cup holders. Other than that, he'd spend his time hunting, chasing after deer, wild boars, and above all, lions. And we see a terrified lion running away from him as Louis the First, King of the Sheep, rides another sheep for the lion. <laughs> but since there were no lions in this kingdom, he would have to have them brought in for his pleasure. <laughs> He'd also stroll through his royal gardens, which would be tended by only the best gardeners. And there we see him with a parasol moving into the manicured gardens. And Louis I would receive the world's greatest artists at his palace, where they would perform before him and his court. We see two tiny ballerina sheep dancing for him. <laughs> Ambassadors from far and wide would also travel long distances to pay tribute to him, king of the sheep. And we see all these creatures bowing down to him in his royal meat throne. But first and foremost, Louis the first decided he must bring his bring order to his kingdom. So he commanded his people to march behind him in sheep step. <laughs> we'll be very richly behind Louis the first. Next, Louis decided that uh, only sheep who resembled him could live at his side. And here we see sheep of every other color running away. <laughs> the others must be driven out. We see him alone on top of the hill. All the other sheep far away. But then, upon another windy day, 
We see him holding onto the ground, clutching it. We see it flying off his head and his eyes wide, squealing. We see him reaching for it as it blows in the air. We see him looking sad. We see him returning to four legs. Louis the first, king of the sheep, became Louis the sheep once again. On the last page, I see a wolf with the crown on. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time where we can hold the joys and sorrows of our community. I invite you to speak from your heart. If you feel called to share with us a joy or a sorrow, um, I would invite you to stand and speak into the microphone. And uh, what we'll do is we'll respond to you by doing and saying, we hear you, we hold you, and we care for you. We hear you, we hold you, we care for you. It's a way to close the loop of witnessing each other in both the joys and the sorrows of our lives today. We'd love to invite any children who'd like to go to RE today, Jan Wright, our director of religious education is in the back. So if anyone would like to do that, you're welcome to. Or if you feel like a child. Janet's really good. <laughs> we can also think about it for a second while we do joys and sorrows. Anyone in the community have a joy or a sorrow they'd like to share? Thank you. I just got a kitten the other day. Yay! And I really enjoy it. What's his name? Her name is Billy Eilish. Thank you. Let's share. We hear you. We love you. We love you. I just want to share a joy and a suggestion. My name is Janet, and I got to go to a concert the other night. Um, Santana, Carlos Santana with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And the reason I'm sharing this, especially with you guys, you use. You use, you need to go. You need to go see these people if you have a chance to do it. It is unbridled joy and spirituality, as well as music that will knock your teeth right out of your face. So good. But the but but especially, you know, the 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 joy. You know, we came out of it and my daughter said, I almost have faith in humanity again. They're so <clears throat> yes. Thank you. So for you, for your joy, and for Santana, let's say. Hear you. We hold you. And we care, care for you. Thank you. I have great joy in that uh, Sherry was uh, instrumental in uh, fixing the front steps here. So we the old folks that the steps. She did a real good job, I think. <laughs> So for caring for all of us and for our, our new railings and steps, let's say. We hold you. We hold you. We care for you. Thank you. Now we need to change. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my name is Nim, and it would take me too long to stand up. But I, uh, I just want to express my deep sorrow about what the Supreme Court is doing for the country that we're trying to celebrate today. Um, and that's a biggie, so. Oh. So for, for you, ma'am, and for, for everyone who's suffering because of this and everyone who feels the pressure of this, let's say, and mean it. Hi, I'm Lise. I just want to uh, express joy uh, as a reaction to the sorrow that has recently occurred in our country. And um, I uh, have transitioned uh, from being Catholic, and I feel so much joy being here. Thank you for restoring my hope. <laughs> Thank you. From one former Catholic to another. <laughs> <laughs> We hear you. 
Thank you for being here. Let me check the None on Zoom. And in a blending of traditions for all those joys and sorrows that are too tender to say here or that you'd like to talk about at coffee hour privately, we're going to put a bunch of pebbles in the bowl. Oops. Good morning. Again, my name is Kathy Hartman. I am a worship associate. Pay close attention because this could be you. We have openings. Early June, I looked at the service schedule and I was surprised to find that I had signed up for today. One does not sign up for July 3rd and then ignore July 4th. And this is not one of my favorite holidays. The fireworks start in my neighborhood around mid-June and they continue through about mid-July till they all run out. The displays of cheap patriotism are annoying at best and sometimes downright hostile. But I also think back to my childhood. My dad loved the fourth and he would collect M80s and cherry bombs and bottle rockets and all manner of fireworkers, fireworks. And um, on 4th of July, we literally had a blast. And we also got to climb up on the roof because we lived out in the country and the Fireworks were over Lake Michigan, so we could climb on the roof of the house, which was really a treat too. So good times in childhood, but as an adult looking at Independence Day, I think about the idea of independence from versus independence to. This holiday is all about the wrongs done to the colonies by Great Britain, the move to declare independence from Great Britain, and the bloody revolutionary war to secure our independence. I had to memorize the first paragraph and a bit of the second of the Declaration of Independence and I always resented reciting, all men are created equal. Even as a child, that sentence galled me, but I was regularly instructed that men really meant men and women. But the next sentence gives lie to that. Governments are instituted among men, this time with a capital M, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This just reinforced my unease. Most of the governed couldn't express their consent or dissent because of exclusion. 56 men signed the declaration. According to one study, all but nine of them were slaveholders. So the slaves didn't figure in. Dr. Samuel Johnson, a contemporary English literary figure famously remarked, how is it we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Native Americans weren't in the equal category. If LGBTQ folk had been identified, you could be sure they wouldn't be equal. And of course, half the population wasn't created equal according to the 56 white men. 
would it really have been so much of an intellectual leap to realize that as they declared independence from an oppressor, that they could expand, extend independence to those regularly oppressed in this country. Somebody's getting a call. Thomas Jefferson was an intellectual giant. Words and ideas were his strong suit. Perhaps if he could have used that considerable intellect to be more inclusive, then slavery and the Indian Wars would have ended much earlier. Women and minorities would have taken the reins of government so much earlier, and what might things look like today? As Representative Liz Cheney said recently, these days, for the most part, men are running the world, and it's really not going that well. This is not a rant about men. In the past few weeks, we can see that women, such as Justice Amy Conant Barrett, can be equally good at denying various groups the independent thought to control lives, health, and safety. It feels like we have to start all over again to secure our rights to basic values that are being trampled by an unrepresentative court and an unrepresentative federal and state government, Colorado being a bit of an exception. The more I despair, the more I look to those who haven't, those who won't give up. There's no cheap patriotism here. Well, except maybe for this t-shirt. I declare that I will work harder and express more strongly the true patriotism of civic trust engagement and solidarity. You might have read the July 1st New York Times opinion by Jedediah Britton Purdy from his book, Two Cheers for Politics, Why Democracy is Scary, Flawed, and Our Best Hope. He writes that progressives need patriotism more than ever in a time of understandable anger and despair. We want to make the world better by our lights. And to do that, we need a stronger democracy. Patriotism shouldn't be an excuse for glossing over failures and crimes, just the opposite. It adds responsibilities, even sorrows to our lives, but it also fosters affection and yes, pride. Frederick Douglass, who was an escaped slave who went on to become a social reformer, abolitionist, writer and statesman was asked to give a speech on July 5th, 1852 for the 76th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Let me close with his words. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I am the arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I, therefore, leave off where I began, with hope, while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. If he can be hopeful, so can we. May it be so. And now we uh, move into the offering time. Could the ushers come forward, please? Each week we take a collection. We walk our talk by also adding some financial assistance into the mix. And each quarter we designate an agency that we provide half of the collection plate to. And this quarter, today is the first day of the new quarter, um, is the Thompson Education Foundation, which um, provides all kinds of additional support to the students in the Thompson School District, including um, last year over 1,500 backpacks filled with school supplies. They provide special grants and scholarships to students and teachers, funds for unhoused youth, help with music and art programs and field trips. The director will be here in a couple of weeks and she'll flesh that out and let you know a little bit more about what they do, but it's a great organization. So give generously and we'll listen to a little music while we're... Oh, yes. So you can return to 
ushers want to come forward. Note these fine ushers. This is another position we have plenty of openings for. <laughs> Thank you. Please um, recite with me. If you all remember it, you can help me out. Um, we dedicate ourselves and these are offerings. We dedicate ourselves and these are offerings. To the uh, work of this congregation and all the good things we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I said I'm going to print that and put it in the basket. I know, that's so a good can, idea. Yeah. yeah, good job. <laughs> I saw a post on Instagram this week that read, I don't think America's allowed to have a birthday party this year. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't either. It's difficult for me today to stand up here and celebrate the country we live in, which is right with the consequences and divisions of polarization. Yes, there's a January 6th committee and there are midterms and there's gun violence and an unimaginable massacre of migrants in the back of a semi trying to live the American dream and so much more. But in preparing for this service, I continue to reflect on the zeal and the heartache that we shared last week together when discussing the Supreme Court's recent decision to overturn years of settled precedent and eliminate a constitutional right for women and people who could become pregnant. I couldn't stop thinking about the foreclosure of their independence before Independence Day. On May 3rd of this year, Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, responded to the recently confirmed leak, eliminating the right to abortion care by the Supreme Court by writing, comprehensive reproductive care, including access to abortion, is essential to the health and well-being of women and pregnant people. We will continue to work with those most impacted by this harmful decision to fight for permanent state and federal legislation that codifies and enshrines the right to access abortion care. Our faith as Unitarian Universalists urgently calls us to advocate on behalf of all people so that they can readily access safe, legal abortion care whenever and wherever they need it. We will not rest until that reality is true across the country. On the same day, in an interview with Christianity Today, Brent Leatherwood, the acting president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, rhapsodized, this is truly a breathtaking development. Assuming it remains a majority opinion, as we now know it did, it means that we are one step closer to ending the Roe Casey abortion framework that has stalked this nation for 50 years. It feels almost like a dream to be able to say that. The entanglement of evangelical Christians and the political right in our world today may not be stronger anywhere than in the issue of abortion. Christianity Today goes on to write, white evangelicals are the most pro-life group in the country. They're twice as likely as the average American to want to make abortion illegal. After generations of pro-life activism and a flurry of conservative appointments, including three justices under President Donald Trump, the Supreme Court is finally poised to overturn the 1973 landmark abortion case. And while the latest Pew research links 61% of Americans agreeing that abortion should be legal in all or most cases, a number which jumps to 71% when the life of the mother is at risk, we are continuing to experience targeted and a regressive ruling which limits the life, agency, and privacy of people to make choices about their own bodies, families, and needs. Yet, the debate over the right to women's health care is a re relatively new invention in the Christian right. It was developed in the effort to consolidate power and money through culture war issues. While Southern Baptists and Unitarian Universalists seem quite far apart on this issue today, 51 years ago, we were in harmony. In 1963, the UUA adopted a resolution they read, be it therefore resolved, the Unitarian Universalist Association support the enactment of a uniform statute making abortion legal. If there be grave impairment of the physical or mental health of the mother, the child will be born with a serious physical or mental defect, pregnancy resulting from rape or incest, there exists some other compelling reason, physical, psychological, mental, spiritual, or economic. Eight years later, in 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention adopted a nearly identical resolution. 
be it further resolved, they wrote, that we call upon Southern Baptists to work with legislation that will allow the possibility of abortion under conditions such as rape, incest, clear evidence, and severe fetal deformity, and carefully ascertained evidence, the likelihood of damage to the emotional, mental, and physical health of the mother. What is it that has put people of faith so far apart from each other on an issue we agreed upon not too long ago in our democracy? Against the strategy, money and power that undermine democracy. Nancy McLean outlines this journey in her essential book, The Just Then We Must Democracy and Change, The Deep History of the Radical Right Self Plan for America. She writes, pushed by a relatively small number of radical right billionaires and millionaires that become profoundly hostile to America's modern system of government, an apparatus decades in the making. Funded by those same billionaires and millionaires that keep working to undermine the normal government of our democracy. This push away from democracy is particularly salient in discussion of people of faith because, as the claim quotes, democracy, the towering African American historian John L. Franklin observed in his World War II, is essentially an act of faith. Democracy is essentially an act of faith. But their fighters are pirates seeking money and power. And for Southern Baptists, those pirates are literal churches. The New York Times reported in June 2021 that a group of Southern Baptist chapters brought pirate flags to this convention in order to protest how far left that organization had gone. These self proclaimed pirates were outraged by the middle of the conservative road stamps the convention was taken on culture war issues from critical inferior to abortion. They wanted to overthrow the organization's efforts toward democracy by implementing their own strictly controlled oversight. We have also struggled with similar problems that we do in recent years. Yet we continue to celebrate the freedom and pursuit of meaning that is unique to the inherent worth and dignity of every human life. We live a faith in democratic principles that seek to support the normal government of democracy. The work of faith in democracy is reliant on the belief that every individual can make choices about their agency and outcome themselves. Southern Baptist and Southern Universalists told their claims to believe just six years ago. Democracy is also a belief in the power of free thought and the exercise of possibility rather than restriction. Democracy on its most basic level means the will of the people, the will of a vast majority of the country, to protect the right to a little bit. Yet here we are, sharing the face of money and power, which through a concentrated effort over the past 50 years has created a legal apparatus which can act squarely outside the bounds of democracy. How do we the call from Amanda Gorman, our fellow fighting this morning, to leave behind a country better than the one we're left with? This July 4th, this Independence Day, let us use the fire of our commitment to live into justice. Let us hold the fragile faith we have in democracy from going to last time. It's so powerful to the people to fight. If only we're brave enough to be it. If only we're brave enough to be it. In calling for our bravery, she inspires us to stand as we are proud to move as Unitarian Universalists on the side of love. She also challenges us to literally be the thing we are seeking, even in the face of people and ideas that have changed so dramatically in a short amount of time. Gorman engages with reference to the famous Gandhi quote to be the change we wish to seek in the world, but she emboldens it with a call for our bravery. May we deepen our practices of democracy this independence. Maybe it'll help us all become a little bit more independent of money and power. Maybe it'll help us hold on to the promises of freedom we share with other people of faith not too long ago. Maybe our radical example will inspire some of them to do the same. Maybe not all of them, but the wind of change may help some of them. 
that would be something worth telling. We're now going to sing and invite you to stand and invite our spirit number 170. We are a gentle, angry people. <laughs> Personal favorite, but fit well here. We're going to do verses one, two, three, and five. One, two, three, and five. with some more words from Amanda Gorman, her poem, Back to the Past. At times, even blessings will bleed us. There are some who lost their lives and those who were lost from ours. Who we might now re-enter, all our someones summoned softly. The closest we get to time travel is our fears softening our hurts unclenching as we become more akin to kin as we return to who we were before we actually were anything or anyone. That is when we were born unhating and unhindered, howling wetly with everything we could yet become to travel back in time is to remember when we all knew of ourselves was love. So that's the end of our service. I'm going to make one announcement, which is kind of a continuation of what I've been doing throughout the service. So this, for those of you who are new, this is our first service without our beloved minister, Reverend Laura Liebert, who is back in California, retired, and hopefully enjoying her Sunday morning off. Um, and we did it. We, we, we do these services. We are more than capable of doing them without Laurel being here, and we hope that we are really presenting words and songs that are meaningful, but we need help. Right now it's all hands on deck. And so we have um, openings for worship associates, which we will be doing trainings for and will support. Um, we need ushers, we need people to help with coffee. Cherry's done our music this morning and she's just waiting for me to be quiet so she can go over and help with the coffee. So a lot of us are doing a lot of jobs and 
I'm just putting the plea out. We really will, will help in any way to get you oriented, to get you involved, but it's time for us all to step up and make this congregation work smoothly. So thank you for being here this morning. I hope those of you who are new will come back and um, let's go have something to eat. Can I just invite, um, sometimes I know coming to a new congregation can be, ah, but I just would invite uh, um, uh, us who are, who are here more Sundays than not to, to step up and to introduce yourself and to greet some of our new folks and maybe invite them to coffee hour, which um, we're so grateful has been set up just outside. So thank you all for being here. I'll see you at coffee hour. <laughs>